it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hi, this is YouTube's Ultimate Mordecai, and you are listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be chatting with uh, Shane, who comes to us from Ohio, and he's actually a municipal court judge, and he had an encounter with a dog man when he was younger. Uh, so Shane will be going into that tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out SasquatchChronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Shane to the show. Shane, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Big fan of the show. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate you being here. And I know when you were younger, you actually had a run-in with a dog man. And I was really fascinated when I read your email um, if you would, Shane, would you just kind of start from the beginning? Kind of tell us what you were doing and walk us into what happened. Sure. This was back mid eighties, like 85, 86. I was a high school kid and I was a, I was a runner, a high school runner. And every year my town is a, I live in a city called Bucyrus and, um, we have a big bratwurst festival every year. I probably doesn't rival Wisconsin, but for around here it does. And so we always had this, uh, you know, at the end of the summer, third weekend in August, we had this 10K. And it brought people from all over Ohio. And, you know, and I was training for that. And um, it had been really hot. It had been hot about three or four days in a row. And I went out to try to get some training runs in. It was just miserable. So I knew it was going to be hot. And I said, well, you know, I got to run five miles. That was my training I had to do. And I thought either I'm going to get up early in the morning and do it before it gets hot or I'm going to do it at night. <clears throat> I'm not a morning person, never have been. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to do it at night. Now, I lived out in the country about four and a half miles out of town. If, if you're familiar with Ohio, for Ohio listeners, I lived right on State Route 4. State Route 4 runs right through the middle of the state, goes north and south, and leads you right up to Cedar Point and Lake Erie, one of the probably the most traversed you know, state routes other than the big ones, you know, that run through Columbus. So I lived on a, on a farm. I wouldn't run on state route four because back then, and even still today, there's a lot of semi traffic would buzz up and down there. And, and, and it's just a two lane highway. I mean, it's just two lanes. And so in fact, the, the funny thing is, is as a kid, my mom never let me have a bicycle because she said, look, you'll get killed if you ride that bicycle out on route four. And, and she was probably right. And I, it was until I was about 10 years old, she would even let me go out to the mailbox to even get the mail 
because the semis were so, I mean, they zoomed by there so fast, literally it would suck the, the mail right out of your hand if you, you know, if you were standing there. So I was, you know, 15, 16 years old now. I always did my training runs down this little country road. It was called Temple Road. It was, you know, a car length and a half wide, I think. And it was just right through the middle of the country. There were about three houses on Temple Road. They were all spread out. What I would do is I'd leave my house and I'd go south about uh, 100 yards maybe. And then I would turn right onto Temple Road. And I could go two and a half miles down was State Route 98. That would be my turnaround point. And I would come back and that'd be my five miles. It was about 9.30 at night when I started off. You know, somebody might think, well, gee, that's unusual. Some kids can go run it at night in the country. Not at all. I mean, I was a country kid, wasn't scared of the dark. I mean, we did. I mean, I was eight years old playing hide-and-go-seek and dark barns and running through cornfields and, and stuff like that. So <clears throat> being out at night never, never bothered me at all. I mean, there was – and keep this in mind – you know, North Central Ohio, there's no bears, there's no wolves, there's no bobcats. I mean, there's nothing out there that would be dangerous to a kid other than a human being. And, and, and back in the 80s, I think we were pretty naive about, you know, people grabbing kids and stuff like that. But I, I was a 15, 16 year old boy. Nobody was going to grab me. I just ran from them. But so to understand the sort of the geography, so I turned right on the Temple Road, and for about a straight mile to my right was corn. And the corn, you know, middle, you know, early August was, was about head high, and I'm almost six foot. So this corn was about six foot tall. And so on my right was corn, and on my left was beans. And it ran that way all the way down to the first crossroad, which is a little road called Flickinger Road. And at that time... As soon as you cross Flickinger Road, which is about a car length wide, there was a woods. And I can't tell you how many acres the woods would have been back then, but it was pretty thick. Past that, there was a house and, you know, more cornfields, more bean fields. So on this particular evening, the moon was out, was not a full moon, but it was very, I mean, there was a lot of light. I mean, you could see there was a lot of visibility. And so I got down the State Route 98. I made my turnaround. I was coming back, and I got back to where Flickinger Road was, which means I was about a mile away from being home. And for some reason, I caught my spider senses, but something just went off like a like an alarm in my body that told me something wasn't right. And I and I stopped, and I started looking at the woods because I just got this. I just got this feeling that there was something in the woods. As I was standing there looking at the woods, I noticed that across from the woods, across that little little side road Flickinger, that there was something in the corn. Now, like I said, the corn was about head high and it was moving, like a lot of corn was moving. So I knew it wasn't a dog, <clears throat> okay? And my first gut instinct was there were deer in the corn because we have tons of deer. But it was weird. The, the way the corn moved, there was something that told me it wasn't a deer. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a person or two people. And I was like, I don't know. Who would be out here in the middle of nowhere, you know, messing around? So I thought, I'm going to get the hell out of here. So I took off. You know, I took off at a pretty brisk pace. And when I took off running, whatever was in the corn, it took off running with me. And it stayed in the corn about three to four rows in. And it kept perfect pace with me. I mean, it didn't fall behind me. It didn't get ahead of me. It was like pacing me. And that really freaked me out because, for one, the corn's really thick. And I thought, how could it see me? Like, how did it know what pace I was running because I couldn't see it. I could see the corn moving, but I couldn't see what it was. How did it know how fast I was running in order to keep pace with me? And that really freaked me out. And I realized then 
this was no person in the corn. No person could have ran. And I don't know to my listeners out there who've ever tried to run around in a cornfield. No way are you running at night in a cornfield that fast. And then I realized, you know, it can't be a deer because a deer would have ran away from me. A deer wouldn't have ran with me. It wouldn't have paced me. <clears throat> and so I got really scared and I stopped because I felt, wanted to see what the hell this thing was. And when I stopped, whatever was in the corn stopped too. I mean, it, and when I say stopped, I mean, it came to a dead stop and, and was perfectly still. It wasn't like the corn was moving like you know, it doesn't like it stopped running, but was still kind of muscling around in the corn or, or anything like that. The, the corn didn't move. I mean, it didn't move. And so I stood there staring, thinking something's going to happen here, and nothing did. And so I thought, she's out. I got to, you know, uh, this is this is creeping me out. And then I got scared. So I got this big adrenaline rush. <clears throat> and when I got the big adrenaline rush, I just took off as fast as I could. And when I took off, like I was, you know, coming out of the sprinter's block, it took off too. And once it, it kept pace with me. So I knew coming up, so a half mile, the half mile mark for me to get home was an old farmhouse with some old buildings. And I knew from running up and down that road, I knew that there was a big tree that set out by the road. I mean, a huge tree. And I thought, I'm going to scale, I'm going to just climb this tree and I'm going to get up high enough where I can either see what's in the corn or if whatever it is comes out of the corn, I'm going to be up high and it's not going to be able to get me. Probably wasn't the best idea because then I'd have been stuck up in the tree. Yeah. But at the time that, that was, you know, to a teenage kid who's panicking, that seemed like the most logical thing to do. So when I got close enough to the tree, I mean, I'm gunning it and it, you know, I'm sprinting and it's, it's staying with me. I noticed that somebody had dehorned the tree, which means all the lower branches they had cut off. So I don't know when that happened, but I'm like, crap, I can't climb this tree because this tree was really big. I mean, it was really big around and they had cut all the, the, the smaller limbs off. So I, I couldn't have got up it. So now I'm stuck. So my adrenaline is like, you know, they have that fight or flight and you get that big adrenaline rush. Well, you only have so much adrenaline and I just burned it all out. And so I just felt exhausted, like, like really like, you know, couldn't hardly breathe because I had ran so hard. So I stopped by the, by the farmhouse and the thing in the corn stopped, you know, it, it stopped as well. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? So right after the, right, right after the farmhouse is when the bean field picked up. And so, you know, the corn's on my left, beans are going to be on my right. And I thought, okay, I got a half mile to go. I don't know what's in the corn. I don't, I, it's keeping pace with me. I now know I can't outrun it because I'm running as hard as I can and it's keeping up perfect pace with me. So if it can run perfect pace with me in the corn, then outside the corn on the road, there's no way I can outrun it. So I know I'm about a half mile from home. And for me to get home, I'm going to have to get to route four and I'm going to have to turn left. And if I turn left, I'm going to intersect with whatever's in the corn because, you know, for me to get home, I got to cross I got to cross the busy road to get to my house. I might have to cut left. Now the corn did not run all the way up to route four. There was a, like a ditch. And then there was probably 10 yards, maybe, maybe not that much of like just untillable ground. And it had weeds and wildflowers and stuff like that. So there was going to be about a, about a, you know, a 10 yard, five yard stretch of where this thing, if it was, if it came out of the corn, it, it was just going to run right into me. We'd be, you know, we'd run right into each other. So I thought, man, I can't turn left. I can't go home. And one of my best friends lived to the right. So I could get to route four and I could turn right and I could try to go to his house. And he lived about 200 yards down. So part of me thought about trying to cut across the bean field. You know, not even make it to Route 4, just 
cut diagonally across the bean field to try to get down to where his house was, even though he was still across the road. I'd still have to cross the road. But then I realized, no, if you've ever, if you're familiar with beans, there's no way I could have cut across the beans because I would have been, I wouldn't have been going with the rows that have been cutting across them. And if this thing would have came out of the corn to get me, I couldn't have ran in the bean field at all. I'd have tripped and fell and it had me. And I thought, well, at least if I'm on asphalt, I could, you know, I could move, I could juke, I could twist, I could try to, you know, if you, it reminded me like, you know, if you're playing, remember when you were a kid playing tag and even though a kid was faster than you and they were chasing you, you could always kind of juke or angle and they would miss you. Yeah. I know that sounds kind of silly, but <clears throat> that was kind of my thought process in a panic moment was at least if I'm out on the road, I could do this whole you know, playing tag thing where I'm twisting and jerking, you know, and trying to get out of the way. But in the bean field, I stuck. There's, there's no way. So then I thought, okay, here's the plan. I got to get to route four and I got to get right and, and sprint to my buddy's house. But the problem was, you know, and as I explained before, route four is an incredibly busy highway with, with semi trucks and, you know, and just regular traffic. And th- with this being the summer, there's all kinds of Lake Erie traffic that's always coming and going. So one of the the problems is if, you know, I'm going to try to sprint across the road, but I have to be cognizant of the fact that there's semis zooming up and down this road. I could just get hit. You know, I, you know, I get killed by the, by the truck, not whatever's in the field. So I said to myself, look, you got to conserve energy. So I broke into a very light jog. Because I figured, look, I'm going to wait till I get about 15 yards or so, 20 yards, 50 yards from Route 4. And when I see that I can get across, I'm going to, you know, dead sprint, don't look back, gun it to my buddy's house. So I had to conserve some energy because I'd blown up, you know, my adrenaline. So I start this, you know, light jog, very light jog, trying to gather myself. And the thing that was in the corn, it started running too. And it kept pace with me. And as I was getting closer to route four and I started picking up the pace, it's picking up the pace. And it's, I mean, it's probably, I'm going to say the furthest away it probably ever was, was probably 25 feet, maybe away from me. Um, And I say that pretty close, really. Oh, it's close. Yeah. I mean, the roads is it's just not a very wide road. Where this was, and the reason why I say that is because I think to myself, you know, if I'm shooting a three pointer in basketball, that's 20 feet. It was about five feet behind that. So it's, it's that close to me, but I never heard it breathing. I never heard any, I never heard it make a sound like it was silent other than the rustling of the, of the, you know, the corn stalks. So I told myself when I get to the point where I'm going to, where the corn ends, I'm not going to look back. I said to myself, don't look back because I was scared that if whatever was in there, I might freeze up. You know what I mean? I might see it and I might hesitate. And so I thought, I don't want to look. I don't want to look. So I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. And I noticed that there's a semi coming from the left. And, but it's far enough back that, I, that I'm going to be able to get across the road. And so as I go, as I start to angle to the right, and to hit, you know, to try to hit top speed, I couldn't help myself, and I looked back. And when I looked back, what I saw was this thing about six foot tall, because its head was about even with the top of the corn. And it just walked out of the corn, and six foot tall, and it had the head, head of a dog, um sort of a muscular type chest its shoulders were rolled forward like it like somebody who had really bad posture you know its shoulders were rolled forward long arms and i could not see its legs below the knees i, I never saw its knees so i can't tell you what what its knee joints or anything like that look like and it lo- turned its head and it looked at me and to me it looked like and this is the first, the, the, the only frame of reference I had was it looked like the Egyptian god Anubis because 
that having seen that in books or seen that on TV, that's what it looked like. It looked like the Egyptian god Anubis with that head. And it looked to me like it was going to drop to all fours. Like if it was going to chase me, it was going to drop to all fours. And, and the, the reason why I said it was because its posture, the way it had the rolled shoulders and bending forward, it was kind of like, and I don't know if anybody out there, a football reference. Have you ever seen like a, a linebacker who's, who's playing defense, how they're in an athletic stance and they're leaning forward on the balls of their feet and their shoulders are kind of forward? You know, that's what it looked like to me, that it was going to drop to all fours. Whether it was or not, I don't know. And so I see that, and I get a good look at it. It, it was dark, like it had dark fur on it. And I bolt across the road, and I'm convinced that it's right behind me. You know, I'm convinced that it's chasing me. And I sprint. It's just as hard as I can. And my buddies had an indoor, or I'm sorry, an in-ground pool. And they had a chain link fence around it. And half the time, the swinging gate to that pool was open, and half the time it wasn't. And I'm sitting there praying, my God, I hope this gate's open, because if I have to stop and try to unlatch that gate, it's got me. And so as I'm getting closer, I notice that the gate is closed. And I'm like, oh, no. So as I get close to it, I just say the hell with it. And I jump as high as I can. And I throw my legs up in the air like the side, like the old Fallsbury flop. And I try to put my hand on the top of the fence and the scalloped wires on it just cut me right across my side. I land in a stumbling thing and I just dive right into a swimming pool head first. I blew all my air out and I let my chest like drag across the bottom of the pool. And when I got to the deep part, it was about 10 feet deep, I pinched my nose and I just sat there on the bottom of the pool looking up, fully anticipating that whatever th this thing that I saw come out of the corn was going to be standing on the edge of the pool and I'm just going to be like, I'm totally screwed. And I sat on the bottom of the pool, what seemed like minutes, but I'm sure it was probably 30 seconds, if that. And gasping for air, I swim to the top, and it's nowhere around. I jump out of the pool. I rip open the sliding glass door on my buddy's patio. And his parents were home at the time. He had no idea I was coming. And this was back in the 80s, and he had one of them big giant satellite dishes you know, remember those things that just look enormous and here he had dialed into the playboy channel and i scared the absolute hell out of him because he thought it was his parents coming in and he yells and i he looks at me and said what the heck are you doing you know and i i kind of tell tell him what happened and and he was convinced that i saw a deer or i saw a coyote or i saw i can't remember what all else he said you know, he saw and I'm like, no, man, you, 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 no, I did not. That's not what I saw. It's not what I saw. Whatever was in the corn, it wasn't a deer. And um, it scared. I mean, it just it, it just scared me because I knew how fast that thing was that if it would have came out of the corn, I couldn't have I couldn't have got away from it. And so for years, I pondered, why didn't it catch me? You know, why didn't it run me down? Why didn't it catch me? Was it just playing with me? Was it toying with me? And then the other thing I wrestled with is, you know, what is it? You know, what was it that was there? Because I played cards with, with a group of friends the next night, and I told them the story, but I left out what exactly I saw because I knew they would have just roasted the hell out of me. You know what I mean? They would have, oh, they would have made fun of me like you wouldn't believe. And so even the guys at the table, you know, were playing cards like, well, you know, it could have been this, it could have been that. And I'm thinking, or thinking, look, dudes, you didn't see what I saw. You know, you, you didn't see it. So, you know, the interesting thing, Wes, is I never thought that it was a werewolf. You know what I mean? Because you have to understand, in the 80s, there was no internet. Um, there was no frame of reference for me. And to me, the werewolf was Lon Chaney Jr. when a pair of, of jeans and a, and a torn flannel shirt and a flat face, you know, like a human face with just, just hair on it. So for me, I didn't know what it was. And so, you know, as I grow up and I eventually became a, a lawyer and I'm now a judge in my hometown, 
and I started doing some research and in, in early on, I was thinking, is this like a hellhound or something? Was this something, cause I'd heard of these things and you remember, uh, whole Sherlock Holmes and the, and the hounds of Baskerville. Yeah. And, and you hear some of this stuff about, you know, these black dogs with red eyes chasing carriages and therefore for a long period of time, I thought, well, you know, was it something like that? Was it some sort of demonic dog that was black dog was chasing me? But it didn't fit the profile. It, it just didn't fit the profile. Why was it standing on two legs? Why did it look? It didn't. Like I said, it didn't look like a dog would look. It looked like the Egyptian god Anubis. That's what it looked like. So then years later, you know, I, I start hearing about this, this phenomena that people are, are seeing called a dog man. And so I, I picked up one of Linda Godfrey's book, who is the, I guess you would say, the godmother of, of dog man, dating back to the Beast of Bray Road, which I knew nothing about. And I was reading this, this account, and this guy says that what he saw looked like the Egyptian god Anubis. And I said, that's it. That's what I saw. Whatever this guy saw is the exact same thing that all he saw. And then it was this, I discovered there was this whole phenomena out there about these things called dogmen. And knowing what other people have seen, I'm convinced that's what was stalking me that night. Yeah, I want to ask you, um, as far as the body goes, was it more manlike? When it stood up and you were kind of watching it? Um, so, so, okay. The arms, and I'll keep in mind, I didn't get, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to sit there and study it, but I got a really good look at it. The arms were sort of thin. You know what I mean? It did not have like a big muscular set of arms. The arms were more spindly, kind of long. You know what I mean? But his chest was big, and, and I'll give you an example. Hey, this is gonna sound really silly to you, but I had a I had a miniature dachshund, and he had short little stubby legs, but he had an incredibly muscular chest. His chest stuck out, and he had this just really strong chest. That's what it reminded me of. It had a big chest but skinny arms and, and sort of big rolled shoulders is what it looked like. It was almost like, it was almost like the arms were not proportionate with the torso. It didn't look like it had these big, powerful arms. It just didn't quite look like that to me. Now, maybe it was the angle I was at, or maybe, you know, with it being nighttime, but I got a good look at it. And to me, it looked more very powerful torso and long arms. Yeah, the other thing I want to ask you about that behavior, you know, you hear that behavior a lot with Sasquatch. Uh, a lot of times people will say, you know, when I stopped, it stopped. When I ran, it ran. When I walked, it mm -hmm. walked. And it's very similar to how you're describing this encounter uh, with this dog man. So you see that same type of behavior, which is strange. I mean, uh, the, you right. have two different cryptids and the exact same type behavior. What do you right. what do you make of that behavior? Do you think it was just curious, or do you think it had other intentions? Well, that that that's a question that, that I pondered I pondered for years. And then uh, one time I was on a uh, I was on an airplane and I was sitting next to this guy and I was by myself and he was by himself and he had a I noticed he was reading a I. Uh, and I don't know if I can't remember for life me if it was a Bigfoot book or had something to do with cryptids. And so I struck up a conversation with him and, and I told him this. I told him my story and he said, wow, man, you're, you're really lucky that you didn't turn left and go towards your house. And I said, yeah, I know, because, you know, I would intersect with he says, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. He had told me that he had been he had hunted wolves up in Minnesota or Calgary, Alberta or someplace. And he said, you know, I think this thing was driving you towards the pack. And then what he said was wolves will send out like a scout and the scout will will sort of push the prey towards the pack. And that wolves very are very reluctant to attack something as big as it one on one 
because for fear they would get hurt. Because if, it, if a wolf would get hurt and not be able to run with the pack, the pack's not going to stick around and wait for it. It would basically be left to die because it couldn't run with the pack. It couldn't hunt. It couldn't feed itself. And so his theory was that there were more than one of these things, and this thing's purpose was to drive me into a kill zone. That really kind of freaked me out because I thought, okay, that makes sense. But at the same time, you know, I've talked to some other people and they're like, I don't know, you know, that that would, you know, if there were four five, six, seven of these things, I mean, you know, they would have to eat. And my gosh, how many calories would these things need to consume? And wouldn't people notice things disappearing and, you know, things like that. So to this day, I'm not sure whether it was just curious of me that it was just toying with me, whether it was trying to drive me, because there's one thing that's perfectly clear. It could have caught me anytime it wanted to. It could have caught me anytime it wanted to. And it was bigger than me. You know what I mean? It was, it, it probably, oh man, I couldn't really put a weight on it, but I was at that time, I was probably 150 pounds and it was, it was substantially bigger than me. If it would have attacked me, I, I I couldn't have fought it off. I mean, imagine this. Imagine trying to get it. Imagine if you got attacked by a 70-pound pit bull. Could you fight it off? Yeah, you're in big trouble if a 70-pound pit bull wants to fight. But to answer your question, no, I don't think I could fight it off. Yeah, if you can't fight off a 70-pound pit bull, you're not fighting off a six-foot-tall, 200-pound thing. I'm convinced it could have killed me. I don't I don't think there was, if it wanted to, that I could have gotten away from it. In a physical fight, I don't think there's any way. Yeah, I find it very odd, though. You know, you have two different, let's say, let's just go with the theory that Sasquatch is an ape, which I don't believe. And let's go with the right. theory a dog man is a dog, which I don't believe. I, yeah. it's, it's very compelling to me that they have that exact same behavior. Exactly right. what you, you describe, know, I've heard a thousand times. And right. that's kind and, of and concerning. The thing about it is, yeah, the thing about it is, I, I, it's not a misidentification. I didn't see a Sasquatch and misidentify it as having the head of Anubis. You know what I mean? Like, I got a really good look at the head. I know what I saw. I, I, I didn't see a Sasquatch. No, it, no, no. That, and that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying you hear right. with the dog man to you, do you hear the same type of behavior? And right. I, for me, that's kind of a little bizarre because you would right. you would think they're two different entities and they yet they're they're portraying the same type of, or displaying the same type of behavior. Uh, I have no doubt what you saw. I've, I've talked to a lot of people who have run into that thing. What, what do you think it is, Shane? I mean, after all these years and kind of looking back on it, what what do you well, think that thing is? So here's the thing. So, you know, I like to think I'm somewhat of an educated guy. You know, I went to law school, obviously, but that doesn't make me a biologist. But, you know, I, I've done some study and I think, okay, <sighs> Is this a biological creature? All right. If it's a biological creature, what? And it's canine. It has a if if it has canine tendencies, why would it stand on two legs? You know wh what's it doing on two legs? Dogs don't stand on two legs. You know wolves don't stand on two legs. But then again, I think well, you know what? When it was pacing me in the corn, it was probably on all fours. It was probably run on all fours. And then when it came out of the corn, I think it probably stood up on its on you know on two legs to get a better vantage point of me, I think. And then if it would have laid chase to me, I think it probably would have dropped down on all fours. And I say that just based upon based upon its physical stature. So I I tend to believe that it's it's a I tend to believe it's a physical animal of some sort. Now I'm part of a podcast. In, called From the Shadows podcast that I started with a good friend of mine. And one of the reasons why I started it was because of my experience and I wanted to give a forum for other people to discuss their encounters. And my partner in that, he doesn't believe that dogmen are physical creatures. He thinks that there is a supernatural paranormal component to them. He and I both agree, though, we don't believe that it's a human that metamorphoses into a wolf i just that's just something i don't believe i think that from a biological standpoint you know the body changing bone structure and and all that kind of, I, I just don't think in the realm of possibilities that that's possible 
So I tend to think it's a biological creature. He tends to think that it is a supernatural creature. The thing is, what's what's its origin? You know what I mean? What's its origin? I mean, animals evolve. We know that. You know, we know animals evolve. But what is this thing's origin? You know, has this thing been around for thousands of years? Or is this something that's just evolved over the last 50 years? You know what I mean? I, I don't. I just yeah. don't know. No, I hear you. Yeah, it's fascinating when you really look. It's been around for thousands of years. As you and I were talking the other night, I was telling you the Sumerians wrote about it. The Egyptians stole it and came up with Anubis. But prior to the Egyptians, the Sumerians were talking about it. And when you start talking Sumerians, whether you believe there was a flood or not, I think most scientists, you know, on a, outside of religion, right. I think most scientists agree there was a flood. Uh, even right. the Sumerians were talking about that. So we're talking pre-flood. The Sumerians were talking about this being running around and it's a hard right. concept, I think, for especially for me, you know, when you think of something supernatural or you think of something paranormal, like a ghost, you can't touch a ghost. I mean, I guess you can, but it's not, you know, it's right. not right there physical in front of you. I will say everyone I've ever talked to that has run into the dogman, they'll say two things. One, it was very physical, was not an apparition. Uh, and they describe it very closely to how you described it. I mean, and I told you that's, I'm very convinced it's out there running around because I've talked to so many people who have seen it and they don't know each other and they're describing the same features from one to the next. Um, mm -hmm. But going off that point, it, you know, I, I kind of think things can be physical and paranormal or supernatural. You know, if you want to go yeah. with religion, uh, you know, like Abraham sat down and ate with three angels. <laughs> you know what I mean? They right. sat there and had a meal. Right. Uh, and that's right. very physical. That's even though it's supernatural, it's very physical. Um, and that's if you go believe in the religion and all the other stuff. But what I'm saying right. is, I'm, it really, I think that something can be very physical and yet not natural. Well, there's certain, I mean, there's obviously certain characteristics about it that, you think about you think about Native Americans, and Native Americans talked about spirit animals, and they talked about you know these things being able to materialize in the form of of wolves or coyotes and things like that. You know what I mean? And so I've always believed that with any folklore, there's always some element of truth to folklore. You know, maybe as the stories get passed down, you know, the, the, the stories change or they become sensationalized or something like that. But there's always something, there's always some rooted facts with folklore. You know, in the end, like I said, the Indians talk about, you know, these things materializing. So maybe that's Dogman. Dogman is a, is whatever it is, it can materialize into a physical form, just like Native Americans believe that, you know, um, different, uh, you know, different creatures could, could, you know, materialize out of thin air and stuff like that. But, you know, the interesting thing is about them is what are they eating? You know, in Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, there's an abundance of wildlife, deer and stuff like that. But I think what, what we talked about, these things have been spotted all over the world. So yeah. Yeah, they have been. what are these things eating? You know, and the thing about it is, you know, you know David Pilates and you know missing four one one. You know, there's a lot of people that go missing in national parks every year, and they find nothing of them. They don't find a backpack that's been torn apart or anything like that. I mean, people go missing and they're never seen of or heard of again. I mean, these things could be picking people off. They could be. I, I just don't know. Yeah, and I think you brought up a good point there. You know, what is its origin? You know, what it what are these things? Mm -hmm. Even with Sasquatch, to be honest with you, I mean, it's like where, where does right. that go? It, it, having a great ape of the size of Sasquatch running around in North America makes no sense. Makes zero sense right. to me. And, and the other thing is, there's absolutely nothing in the fossil record that would support such a thing. Yeah, but it really makes you wonder why people are seeing this stuff today. Why are we seeing all these weird things out running around? Why right. are people running into them? And people can scoff and laugh all they want. People are very consistent on what they saw. Very consistent. Right. Um, oh, well, and, you know, you think about me. I, I didn't tell a bunch of people this story until I didn't tell the story 
in its entirety until it became socially acceptable to tell this story. I mean, all of us deep down do not want to be made fun of and ridiculed. Okay. Nobody wants to be told they're nuts or a liar or, you know what I mean? Or made a fool. And when my buddy and I just started to decide to start from the shadows podcast and part of it was because, you know, I'm turning on the TV and I'm seeing monsters and mystery. I'm seeing tear in the woods. I'm seeing ghost hunters and on the travel channel. I mean, you can't turn the turn on the TV without seeing something about Bigfoot. Um, you know, so yeah, people are seeing these things. They're seeing them a lot. So you can be the doubting Thomas if you want, but you would have to say, gee, there's been thousands of sightings, literally thousands of sightings, and everybody's making this up. Or there's some weird mass hysteria. And I just don't believe that. I know what I saw, and I've and I believe people when they say that what they've seen, what they've seen. I don't I'm look, I'm sure there's people out there that try to seek attention and say they they saw something. But there's just too much, too many eyewitnesses to say, hey, there's nothing out there. You know, yeah, and, no, I, and I agree 100%. Can I ask you, as you're coming up to the cornfield and your spidey senses start going off, I think is mm-hmm. how you put it, do you think there's something to that with in relation to what this thing actually is? You know, because I don't know that you would have done that, let's say, if there was, I know you don't have cougars out there, but if there was a cougar right. sitting in that cornfield, sure, probably would have never even seen it. Even no, oh yeah, and I mean, I may have been. Look, I've been hiking in the woods before, and a cougar could have been within ten feet of me, and I've not even known it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it harkens me back to if there's something paranormal about this, you know. And this is a little off track, but but I use it for for analogy. For about fifteen years straight, I woke up every night at three a.m. Not 2.58, not 3.10, 3 a.m. Now, sometimes it might have been 3.02 or 3.03, probably because my clock was set faster or whatever. But I always woke up, and I couldn't figure out why. And then I was doing research one time on it because it was driving me nuts. And I was thinking I had some sort of sleep disorder. And, and I come across this thing that says the witching hour is 3 a.m. It's not midnight. It's 3 a.m. Yeah. And that at 3 a.m., at 3 a.m., the veil between our world and the supernatural world is at its thinnest. And people that are attuned to the supernatural get jolted awake because they get a, they feel the energy that, that's electricity. You know, like there's like an, like an, you know, first rule of thermodynamics that Einstein came up with is energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. It just takes different forms. And so, you know, I was getting jolted awake and I don't know if it's true or not, but one of the explanations is, is I was sensing my body was attuned to this energy that when the veil between our world and the supernatural world is at its thinnest, I was getting bummed. I, my body was attuned to that energy. So you take me back to being on the road and my spider sense, as I say, went off. Maybe that is my body just attuned to the supernatural, that the energy that this thing gives off somehow my body was attuned to that could sense that energy. I mean, it's an explanation. Yeah, no, I hear you. And I appreciate the explanation. Did you, did you get a sense that was evil? You know, I can't, I, I can't say that. I can't say that I got the, that, that I thought it was evil because I didn't really have time to think about that. You know what I mean? Because, you know, the whole time it's in the corn, there's still this tremendous amount of wonder about what the hell is it? What is in the corn? And so, you know, I, I can't say that I got this impending doom that this thing was this demonic force that was, you know, I, I, I can't say that. I, I just, part of it is it's just terrified. I mean, it's easy for me to tell the story now. You know what I mean? But you have to put yourself in a teenager's shoes, literally, out in the middle of the country at night, and you're being stalked. And you know you don't have a cell phone because they didn't exist, and there's no way you can get away from this thing. Yeah, you're on your own. Yeah, You're on your own. And I didn't have a gun or a knife, and it probably wouldn't have done me any good if I did. 
Um, but just sheer terror. I mean, just sheer unbridled terror is the only thing I can best describe it. Just and, and you like I hyperventilate. You know, part of the story is, you know, I hyperventilated a little bit when when I realized when I ran really hard to the farmhouse and saw that they had skinned the tree down. I mean, I practically hyperventilated, like because I was so scared and my heart was being so fast and I had ran so hard to get to the tree thinking I'm going to be able to, you know, climb up a few limbs and scale my way up this tree. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know what other people's accounts are. I mean, I think I've heard some people describe it as they thought they were looking, you know, at pure evil, but I can't, I can't go on a limb and say that. Yeah, no, and I and I appreciate you know just being forthcoming on it. It's uh, it really is a fascinating account. You know, one of the things Shane uh, that I've come to the conclusion over the years. I don't know if you've ever dealt with you know ever been into a haunted house or ever dealt with. Um, I have experienced that one time. Uh, I wasn't directly. I didn't live there, but I did experience that one time. And I can tell you that there's a weird vibe. There's a weird presence in the air that even though you can't see anything it's just odd i don't know if you understand what i'm saying but it's just odd when you walk in you feel like you're being watched you have this really yeah. weird uh tingling like spidey senses going off something's not right well, here but you can't put your finger on it and the, the bizarre part is you know after you encounter a sasquatch a lot of people including myself you can almost kind of feel when when they're around. This sounds really bizarre. I don't have superpowers, but I've been in situations where my spidey senses were just going off. I hadn't seen anything yet, but I wanted, you know, I wanted to leave. And it didn't hit me till later that I thought those two feelings of being in a home that has that poltergeist presence mm -hmm. and this feeling of Sasquatch being around, they're very similar. It's a very similar feeling. All the same spidey senses go off, um, right? And I've often wondered if there's some correlation with that, um, you know. And, and I, you know, with Dogman, it, I don't know what Dogman is, but people are definitely running into him. But it's weird that throughout your life you kind of look back at certain things and go, you know, I kind of feel the same way here as I do here, and they're very unique feelings. It's not, you know, it's something that you don't feel every day. Well, it, it is, and that's where kind of, you know, we've talked about in our podcast, you know, I, I referenced, you know, the first rule of thermodynamics is that, you know, everything has energy and is our bodies, are, are, are our bodies sort of tuned to feeling or sensing that kind of energy? You know what I mean? So, so you think about it, you know, people do ghost hunting and stuff like that, they they, and I'll probably say this wrong, so correct me. EVPs or whatever they say those yeah. you know those things are. And what are those things? I mean, what are they really detecting? They're detecting energy, right? That's what I assume. That's what they're detecting is energy. And maybe you know our bodies are are tuned to this sort of energy that is being given off by ghosts, poltergeist, Bigfoot, Dogman. That you know we are we are sensing this. You know we have this third eye or you know, a sixth sense that is picking up this energy and it's a self-preservation thing that says, Hey, listen, this is something, you know, you need to be cautious about. You need to be aware of. Maybe you need to flee. You need to get out of here. Yeah. You could be right on that. You definitely could be right on that. I really respect the fact that, you know, that you're a judge and everything and that you would come forward and, and share this. I, I've told you I had four judges on the show, but no one actually ever said, you know, came out and said that there were a judge and I didn't. Yeah. Failed to mention, well, but it is good. It is yeah. it, somebody of your position would mention that. You know, I've had some pretty high you high know, up doctors, famous <laughs> doctors on the show, um, where if you're dying over a certain disease, you're going to go to that doctor. They've come on the show and talked about, you know, Bigfoot and sad, you know different things that have happened to, to them throughout their life. So it kind of normalizes it. You know what I mean? Right. And I don't think that you know me being a judge doesn't give me any more credibility than the next person. But what it does say is that someone in my position would have the courage to say, "Hey, listen, you know, I'm an elected official, but I'm willing to come out and tell people this is what I experienced, and you know that I wouldn't do this if I really didn't experience it." You know what I mean? Because I'm sure they're going to say, "Oh, gee, gee, our judge is some nut." You know what I mean? Um, 
and my brother, who's a judge, even say, goes, man, you sure you want to tell the story to people? You sure you want people to, you know, there's people who think you're a kook. And I told him, I said, no, I think it's important because I want to try to encourage other people who are probably too nervous, too scared, too shy, or worried about being ridiculed to tell their encounters. I want them to know that, hey, listen, I'm willing to do it. You can come out and do it. And if we're ever really going to figure these things out, we need more people to come forward and give their encounters and tell their stories so that we can try to take all these stories and try to put it together like a giant jigsaw puzzle and hopefully one day come up with an answer as to what Sasquatch or Dogman or some of these other cryptids really are. I mean, it'd be be really cool if, if we could. Yeah, well, there's no doubt in my mind. I think one day we'll truly find out what these things are. Uh, But in the meantime, it is nice to have people come forward and we can kind of get a small picture of what these things are and, you know, their behavior and different things like that. And it does start with people coming forward, just like yourself, Shane. I really appreciate you having me on your show. You know, I'm I'm a fan. I I really appreciate you coming on and and sharing it. Tell us again the name of your podcast and give us uh, kind of a quick little rundown of what your podcast is about. So the name of the podcast is From the Shadows Podcast. So that's From the Shadows Podcast. And it was started by me and a friend by the name of, of Shane Grove. And we have a producer, uh, Jason Lewis. And and we have some other members on there. They're good people. And, and we started it just because of this. You know, my experience and my buddy had some experiences, different type of experiences when he was a kid. And we thought, you know what? Let's try to find other people out there and you hear their hear their stories and we sort of picked the name from the shadows because you know these sort of things are in the shadows and we want to bring these topics you know into the light and give people a form by which they can tell them so anybody out there that would you know like to know more here's some of our our, our guests we've had some pretty cool guests on and we're going to have linda godfried on here the 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 you know the godmother of, of dog man is going to be coming on in a week um, you know, check us out. We're on YouTube. We're on Spotify. Um, you know, we try to have a good time with it, you know, um, it's, and, uh, yeah. at the same time, we like to get down to, you know, people's stories. So, yeah, I'll definitely check it out from the shadows podcast. And before I let you go, is there one person you've had on the show or is there one show that really sticks out to you? Um, you know, we had Ken Gerhard on who is, you know, one of the, you know, probably who's who with, with cryptids and, and he told us some really good stories. So, um, you know, he was a really fun, fun guest. So go and check out, um, you know, check us out. And, and there's some, you know, we, we talk UFOs, we talk ghosts, we talk Bigfoot, we talk dog, man, you know, we talk, um, uh, conspiracy theories missing persons we try to you know try to hit a lot of different topic areas because we know there's a lot of different listeners out there that, that have their own genres of of things they want to listen to but uh you know wes i really appreciate you having on if you'd ever want to come on our podcast sometime we'd love to have you we know you've got some great stories so i'm sure our listeners would love to hear from you yeah i'd love to come on thank you so much for the invitation and thank you so much for taking the time to come on thank you have a great day